Well, hello everyone, I'm Maurice Barrett and I've got another study in the Parables and Hard Sayings of Jesus series. I've called this Many Called and Few Chosen. I've never heard anyone preach on this. I know people have mentioned it in sermons, but what did Jesus really mean? Many are called, but few chosen. So this is my revelation on it. It's up to you whether you accept it or have your own explanation. I think a little bit of background would be good. Uh, the last two studies have been the background. This is in answer or the consequences of the incident with the rich young ruler. The ruler came to Jesus and asked for the way of salvation and he told him, he said, well, I've done all that from youth. Is there anything I lack? And Jesus said, yeah, if you want to be perfect, in other words, if you want more than just your ticket to heaven, saved by grace, you want to reign with me, then sell what you've got, give to the poor and follow me. So he let him know that there was a cost, not to salvation. There's no cost to salvation, is there? We, we, we can't get away from that. It's purely by grace. But there's a cost to reigning with Christ. He said, if you want to be perfect, perfect doesn't mean sinless it means mature if you want to be like Christ then do this and then he said a strange thing he said it's harder for a rich man because the, the, the rich young ruler it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle which is impossible in other words it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom it's not difficult for a rich man to be saved is it i know i've got lots of friends who are wealthy really wealthy and they, they're saved i know they've got eternal life but he's not talking about eternal life he's talking about the kingdom will they qualify to reign with christ and the disciples said well if it's it's impossible who can be saved and jesus said yeah it is impossible with men but with god all things are possible and he ends up by saying um he gives a, a parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, not salvation, not eternity, the kingdom of heaven, it's the parable of the men who went to work in the vineyard. And some worked for one hour, some worked the whole day, but they all got the same reward, which is not fair, is it, to, to our you know, perception of equality. Fair days work for a fair day's pay. We think that's godly, but it's not. You know, if God wants to give somebody the full wage for a one hour's work, who are we to question God? He says, can I not have mercy on whom I'll have mercy? Uh, and so it ends up by saying, but many that are first shall be last, because the last in was the first to get the wages, and he got full work wages. So he said, many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then he says, but many are called and few chosen. So that's another statement, isn't it? That's not to do with first and last. This is few, many called, but few chosen. So it's, it's, it's a completely different statement. I know it's added on. So that's what I want to talk about. It's Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. The end of the parable when they complained and said, it's not fair. He said, is this not lawful for me to do what I want with me? It's my money, I employed you. Can I not pay anyone who I want? For many, for the first shall be last, the last shall be first. For many be called, but few chosen. So, first point I want to make, I don't think this is for unbelievers. I don't think this is a gospel message because it's it's about the many, the majority and the few. It's not about the all. Salvation is for the all, isn't it? Whosoever, we preach to the whole, go into the whole world and preach. So this is not about salvation. This is about the kingdom still. And it's talking about the many and the few, the majority and the few. So it's not the all, so it's to believers. And I think it's hard for believers to think that God would select some that is called, some that are saved, for special treatment or positions above others. Christians find that hard. Well, that's not fair. That's not fair. I don't think God would do that. God loves everybody equally. God, God is not like that. God doesn't discriminate. Well, I'm going to challenge that. I don't think God does love everybody equal. And I, I think he does discriminate. 
So I think it's hard for Christians to accept that. But don't forget, the ones who'd worked an hour got a full day's wage. That's not fair. When the others had worked a full day and only got the same wage. See, we mustn't think like the world. Equality and my rights. We've got to have the mind of Christ. And God doesn't think like us. His ways are in the sea. Fancy thinking that God thinks like us. Well, I don't think God would do that. And I don't think... You're not allowed to think what God would do. Read your Bible and find what God did. And you'll find that God does a lot different than we've been led to believe. Well, Jesus clearly told his disciples that he'd chosen them. So they were chosen. Few chosen. How many disciples? There were thousands that followed him. But few disciples. John 15 verse 16. We know this. He said, you've not chosen me. So you can choose to follow Christ, can't you? The gospel, we, we preach the gospel and people say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow Jesus. My dad did that. He didn't repent of his sin. He, he thought he was a good man, actually. He just thought, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. When he heard this Methodist man preach and the Methodist man didn't even believe in miracles. He explained all the miracles in the Bible away, the Red Sea opening and Noah's Ark. He said they're all natural explanations, scientific explanations. So he didn't believe in the miraculous, but he, he believed in salvation by faith. He preached John Wesley's sermon. And my dad thought, well, Jesus seems a man's man. He'd just come out of the army as a commando, parachutist. And he said, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. So he walked up to the front to follow Jesus. He didn't repent of his sin. He didn't know he was a sinner. He said, I've repented ever since. <laughs> He said, but, you know, because God showed him what a mess his life was, and we all need to repent at, at times in our life, don't we? But he started to follow Jesus. So there's thousands of people, that, you know, that's to all. But you've not chosen me. I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. How long should the fruit remain? Till you face Jesus at the judgment seat. Fruit isn't dependent on salvation, or salvation isn't dependent on fruit. When you those who stand before the great white throne, God won't say, "Have you any fruit?" He'll say, "Is your name in the book? Have you accepted Jesus as your saviour?" So it's salvation's clearly on faith in Jesus Christ and His atoning death. It's nothing to do with works and fruit, is it? But the kingdom's to do with fruit. I've ordained you that you'll be the bride that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, He'll give it. Well, interesting point there, that Jesus didn't choose his disciples. He said, I've chosen you, but God gave them to Jesus. That's why he chose them. It wasn't his choice. Let, let me read it. It's God that sets in the church. God sets some in the church. So the fivefold ministry, Jesus doesn't set them. The Holy Ghost doesn't set them. It says God sets some in the church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, after that, gifts, miracles, healings, helps, governments. If you read 1 Corinthians uh, 12, it, it tells you how the Holy Ghost works in the church, the man, the nine gifts of the Spirit. Jesus is the church, the body, and God sets in the body, the church. You, you can read it. And this is God's way of marriage. You know, the father chooses the bride for the son. The son doesn't choose his own bride, does he? It, biblically. Eliezer was sent to, by the father to get a wife for Isaac. That's what God did. And so God has sent the Holy Ghost into the world to get the bride for Jesus. Jesus doesn't choose his own bride. The Father chooses it and the Holy Ghost picks them and said, that's your bride, Jesus, that's your bride. So, of course, Jesus calls them and chases them, but it's not his decision. Let me read your scripture to prove it. Uh, this is the dialogue in the upper room, all right, just before he goes to the cross. And it's his last prayer. And he says this to his father, I have manifested thy name unto the men which you gave me out of the world, that you gave me. I didn't choose them. You gave me out. Thy they were, they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. So that's clear, isn't it? They were yours. You chose them. Well, who were you not chosen in him before the foundation of the world, before Jesus existed as a man? How could Jesus chose them? If you were chosen in him, God chose you and put your name in the book 
before the foundation of the world. It was already there. Moses says, don't blot me out of, blot me out of the book that you've written. So he knew his name was in the book. He knew his, he was predestined, Moses. And he says, well, I'll be damned. If you can't save Israel, I'll be damned with them. Blot me out of the book. Revelation to one of the churches. He that overcomes, I'll give this and this. And I won't blot your name out of the book. So it's for me, it's obviously possible he could. So it's interesting, isn't it, that God chose us before the foundation of the world. They were yours. You you chose them before you created Adam. Have you ever thought of that? Does that not amaze you, astound you, that God chose you before he created the universe? You've not got it, have you? I know the people watching, they haven't got that. You can't get it except by revelation. You'd fall down and worship. You'd be crying your eyes out. Fancy God choosing me, a rotten little sinner, Morris Barra, before the world began. We're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That's the scripture. So forget your doctrine. Just believe scripture. And Jesus said, they were yours, God. They, they were yours and you gave them to me. So in the fullness of time, Jesus was born and the Holy Ghost said to Jesus, that's one, that's one that God chose before the foundation of the world. So he said, follow me, follow me. Can, can you see how, how exciting it is? So it's interesting, isn't it? God chooses the few. Many are called, few chosen. So or I believe all those who are saved by faith are not the bride of Christ because there are conditions to be the bride. I can't go into it. There's hundreds of conditions to reign with Christ. Uh, I think maybe I've got a couple of scriptures. Uh, but the Sermon on the Mount, for a start, qualifications. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, those are all saved. Satanists don't say, Lord, Lord. Buddhists don't say, Lord, Lord. Muslims don't say, Lord, Lord. People who are not saved don't call God, Lord, do they? So not everyone that says, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Go back, Jay. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will have eternal life. He doesn't say that. He's not talking about eternal life. He's talking to people who've got eternal life. And he says, not everyone that's saved that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. They won't all reign with me. And they say, but Lord, we've cast demons out. So these are saved. Mm -hmm. Muslims don't cast demons out. These are saved. We've cast devils out. We've prophesied in your name and done many wonderful works in your name. Jesus didn't say, no, it wasn't my name. That was the devil that did that. He accepted that. He said, it's not doing my works. It's doing my will. You can do all of which. You can manifest all the gifts of the Spirit. If you haven't got the fruit of Spirit, the character of God, that's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, you won't enter the kingdom. Well, think about it. If you were going to reign, would you reign with liars and critics? Obnoxious Christians, proud Christians, I wouldn't reign with gossips in the church, would you? Would you pick to reign in your kingdom with gossips and obnoxious people and selfish people, spiritual or, or adulterers or whatever? You know, if you commit adultery, you don't lose your salvation, do you? You can repent and because it's not by works. It's not how you live. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Grace is grace. It's no point saying, yeah, but... You've got to live a holy life. No, you've got to live a holy life to enter the kingdom. But you, you can live a carnal life and you're saved because it's by faith. He that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Of course, there's rewards and punishments. Well done, good and faithful, you wicked and slothful servant. That's at the judgment seat of Christ. That's not for salvation. So I, I know the kingdom's not preached about. We say, oh, well, you're saved, you've got eternal life. But what about the thousand years reigning with Christ? How can all the church reign? There's too many conditions. Well, Paul talks about the judgment seat here again. 2 Corinthians 5, 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne. Not for salvation. This is when Christ comes and is going to judge us. Uh, judgment must begin at the house of God. Not the world. The world are judged at the great white throne, aren't they? And Christians as well who are not the bride. Because there's those who are saved and those who are not when the books are open. <laughs> we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. How you've lived as a Christian. According to that he has done whether it's good or bad. And we know it's wood, hay and stubble or gold, silver, precious stones. And it says if your works burn top. You've nothing to show for it, but he himself will be saved as by fire. You don't lose your salvation if all your works are bound up. If you've wasted all your Christian life and please yourself instead of pleasing God, if you've not sacrificed, you've not fed the poor, you've not done all that you're supposed to do, and you lived a carnal life, but you believe in God and your sins are forgiven, you don't lose your salvation at the judgment seat of Christ, but you lose your reward. You, you, you can't be in the kingdom. Well, here's some conditions. Suffering is a condition to reign in with Christ. Let me read it, Romans 8, 17. We're children of God, aren't we? If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ. Is that for all the church? No, there's a condition. Well, we're all joint heirs with Christ. It says it, if, if, there's, if is always a condition, you know, I'll buy you this, if. I'll give you this job if, I'll marry you if, if means a condition. So we join heirs with Christ, but Christians think, oh, hallelujah. They don't read the condition. If so be, you suffer with him that you can be glorified together. Glorified is the first resurrection, the rapture. Not all the church will be raptured because they're not all a bride. They'll, they'll carry on and they're saved, aren't they? Where does it say all the church will go up? It's the first resurrection. Paul said that I know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, if by any means I may obtain the resurrection. Well, he wasn't talking about the resurrection for the great white throne because Hitler will be there and Mussolini and Genghis Khan and all the wicked people. They'll be in the resurrection, everyone. The hell will give up the dead and grave will give up the dead. And everyone who's ever lived since Adam will be raised in the flesh and blood to stand before God at the great white throne. So Paul wasn't saying if, if I may attain the resurrection to be judged of God. He must be talking about the first resurrection, which Revelation says, blessed are those who are in the first resurrection. Over them the second death hath no power. You won't stand, if you're in the first resurrection, you won't stand at the great white throne to see if your name's in the Lamb's book of life. You've already got the eternal supernatural body, haven't you? It, it all adds up if you know your Bible. Acts 14, verse 22. Paul went round confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, Enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. He didn't say through much blessing. You don't need tribulation to be saved. It's free. It's absolutely free. That gets you out of Egypt, but it doesn't get you into the promised land. Going over Jordan is the millennium. It's not death. That's a Negro spiritual. Come over into Jordan's land when you die. It's... It's where you conquer the giants, where you rule with the rod of iron and destroy your enemies. Jesus is a Joshua. Jesus is Joshua. It's the same name, isn't it? Yeshua. It's the same name. And Jesus is our Joshua who will come and take the land and he'll rule the nations with the rod of iron and destroy his enemies. That's, that's the promised land. So salvation gets you out of Egypt, but salvation doesn't get you in the promised land. They all perished in the wilderness except two. Many called. Many were brought out. Only two got into the promised land. But they were God's kids. God didn't destroy them all. They walked for 40 years and the shoes never wore out. They had the supernatural food, the manna from heaven for 40 years. But they didn't get in the promised land. They didn't reign. They didn't conquer the giants, did they? They weren't co-heirs with Joshua. Can you see how everything fits if you know your Bible? 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If you if 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 you suffer, it means if you won't suffer, you won't reign. If you deny me, he'll also deny us. Well, 
I just mentioned suffering. There's lots of conditions in the Bible to reigning with Christ. So our works, how we've lived as a, a believer, has no bearing on our salvation, does it? But Paul tells the Corinthians that we'll be judged for rewards or punishment and who'll decide it. And, and I've all put the scriptures up, Jay, I've already said them. Let, let me read it. I've alluded to it. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If you're saved by faith, your foundation is Jesus. If you call yourself a Christian, Allah's not your foundation. Buddha's not your foundation. There's no other foundation for a Christian but Christ Jesus. This is a follower, people who are saved. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, if you're a Christian, Christ is your foundation. So, you're saved, that's your foundation, but you judge not on the foundation because the foundation is perfect. You judge on what building you put up. Let me say that again. Salvation is the foundation. Christ is the foundation, the cornerstone, and you, you built, you, you're on that. But Paul said, be careful how you build. It's up to you how you build. Christ has laid the foundation. He died for you 2,000 years ago. You have nothing to do with it. He died for you and chose you. Now you have to pay the price if you want to reign with him. If any man build upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, obviously that's good, wood, hay and stubble, rubbish. Every man's work will be made manifest. It'll be You'll all be exposed, so will I. For the day shall declare it, what day? The day of the Lord, when he comes to judge, because it shall be revealed by fire. When Jesus comes, what's he like? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild? No, his eyes like flames of fire. That's what he's going to look. And your works will shrivel up. If they're not gold, silver and stones, when Jesus looks at you with that fiery gaze, they'll shrivel up. You won't say, oh, you'll have no contest. It'll reveal by fact, the fire shall test, try every man's work, what sort it is. If every man's work abide, which is built upon, he'll receive a reward. What? Doesn't get burnt in the fire, gold, silver, precious stones. What makes up the bride? New Jerusalem is the bride. I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. This is on the new earth as a bride adorned for a husband. This is the bride, right? What's it? Are the streets made of gold? Are the found 12 foundations precious stones? You can read it. Are the gates pearls? The pearls form through suffering. You won't get in the gate. New Jerusalem without suffering, that's the pearly gates. We think, oh, we're going to the pearly gates. The pearl is formed through suffering. Gold is purified in the fire. You see, we've got to be purified. It's, I think I've, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Well, I do, but I must stop myself. You're on fire. <laughs> so I'm trying to, show that everyone's not the bride of Christ. Many called, this is not the world, everyone's called. But those who are chosen of God to be saved, many called, the majority, but few chosen. Adam and Eve, they're a type of Christ and the bride, aren't they? The whole of the plan of God is in the first few books, the first few chapters of Genesis. Ephesians, we know that in case you don't know that Adam and Eve is a type of Christ and the bride. Uh, Ephesians 5, verse 30. Paul's talking about marriage, or it seems he is. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. He's been taught about marriage. Men love your wives as your own body. And as Jesus loved it and washed it with the water of the words. That's how you treat your wife. So as Christ treats the church, this is the example of how a man should treat his wife. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife. They too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. The way of a man with a maid. Why should I leave my mum and dad? They fed me for 20 years. They clothed me. They looked after me. They loved me. And I say, I'm sorry, mum and dad. I've, I've found this woman in Australia. I may never see you again. And you leave and cleave. 
to a woman who's nothing to do with you, maybe a foreign woman, and you never see your parents again. It's a great mystery why you'd leave your very parents who love you. He said, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. That's the real marriage. You know, the, the fleshly marriage is only a prophecy. Adam and Eve are only a prophecy. My marriage is only a prophecy. I won't be married to Joni in heaven. If she dies tonight, I think, oh, well, I'll see her in heaven. I won't, she won't be my wife. We're sexless, aren't we? We're like the angels. So it's wonderful marriage, but it's only temporary, isn't it? Enjoy it while you've got it, but it's not the be all and end all, is it? For a Christian, because it's not the real marriage. That's why Paul said, I wish you was all like me, single. You could just throw your all your love on Christ and be the bride. You don't have to feel second class. It's different in the world. Oh, you're on the shelf. No, no woman's on the shelf. No man's on the shelf as a Christian, are they? I, I see them completely differently. So it's a great mystery. But I'm speaking about Christ and the church. That's the real marriage. Well, Adam wasn't deceived, was he? It said Eve was deceived. Cl Timothy says, clearly, Adam was not deceived. Eve was in the tr transgression. So he sinned knowingly without deception. He chose to sin. Eve was deceived, seduced. She said that the serpent began me. That's like a sexual seduction. She the serpent seduced me. Adam chose to sin. Why? To keep his wife. Because when Eve sinned, she'd been put out of the garden, wouldn't she? Or the, she wouldn't have access to the tree. She'd have to leave the garden. And the tree of, the, of life keeps a mortal man living forever. Adam would have lived forever in the garden, have the tree of life, and his loved his wife. She'd have been cut off. So he willingly partook of his wife's sin to keep his wife. For love of his wife, he kept, he sinned. That's a perfect type of Christ. We're deceived, aren't we? We're serving the devil. Christ willingly, knowingly became sin to get his bride to keep us. Did he not? Did was he forced to do it? Did he not choose to become sin and partake of our sin? He who knew no sin became sin to redeem us. Can you see how Adam and Eve are a perfect type? All right, you've accepted that. <laughs> Let me give me a little revelation that I got this week when I was doing the sermon. When God wanted to make Eve the bride for Adam, he didn't clone Adam. It wasn't the whole of Adam. He only took one rib, just a part, a remnant. He just took a remnant, one rib. And then he made, he clothed it and brought it to Adam. So many are called, we're all saved, but God's just going to take a remnant out. And where's he going to take it from? The rib. There's, you've got 12 pairs of ribs. You've got 24 ribs. Isn't that amazing? That's 24 is 12 apostles, 12 prophets. The, the 12 prophets represent the whole Old Testament, Israel, and the 12 apostles represent the church. But we become one man, don't we? Those who are of Israel who accept Christ are no longer Israel. We're all the bride of Christ. Out of two, he makes one new man. We're spiritual Israel now. Israel physically becomes spiritual Israel. Israel after the flesh, after God, the Israel of God. And we are Gentiles become the same. Out of two, he's made one new man out of Jews and Gentiles. So I, I thought that this week. I thought that was quite profound, if, if you don't think it's anything. But it's amazing that he only took one rib, a portion, to make Eve. God only takes a remnant. The remnant is all through the Bible, isn't it? Well. Esther, I think, is a good example of the bride. I've used this in other sermons. I don't apologise. I think it's a brilliant illustration. People think Esther uh, is the, the church, a type of the church. I don't. I think the harem is a type of the church, and Esther is a type of the bride. Let me try and convince you. The king wanted a new wife. All right, so we talked about Christ and the church, aren't we? So this is a perfect illustration for me. The king wanted a new wife. So what did he do? Many called. He didn't call everyone, did he? The king 
ruled over 127 counties, provinces, from India to Ethiopia. It's a massive empire, world empire, right? He ruled over it. Did he invite everyone to be the bride? No, he said, choose. Many called. I mean, if 127 provinces, if he chose five out of every country, you know, like five from England, five from Wales, five from wherever, from 120 provinces, you've got a few hundred women, haven't you? Many called. And they came into the palace. And for 12 months, they were purified. They had a, a, an opportunity to be chosen as the bride. Uh, Esther 2, verse 12. With six months of oil. Uh, uh, just go back, Jake. I don't know whether I say it in the text. They, they were purified for 12 months, six months with oil of myrrh. And six months with sweet odours. So they were conditioned outside, they bathed in goat's milk and, and the hair was groomed and olive oil on it, whatever they put on it. They were made beautiful outside, but they were also detoxed inside with herbs and that so the, the breath would smell nice and, you know, wonderful. Twelve months to prepare, a long time. And and is, is it Heggy who was in charge, the one who was in charge of the the the, the, the ladies? That is a type of the Holy Ghost purifying. That's the job of the Holy Ghost to prepare the bride. It leads us into all truth. The Holy Ghost is the chaperone. I've sent you another comforter, somebody to chaperone you and say, don't go there. That'll contaminate you. Go. It's to lead us and, and chaperone us. That's the job of the Holy Ghost to prepare the bride like Eliezer going out to get the bride for Isaac. And so, all these beautiful women were conditioned. And after 12 months, they started to have a relationship with him. They had a sexual relationship. This is what happened in those days. You've got to get, it's a different culture. Men had many wives if they could afford it. God didn't uh, say anything about that. He made conditions for if a man wanted another wife in the law. So, you know, uh, don't think that, that God's like us. That, that's the Old Testament. Now it's back to Adam and Eve, isn't it? We don't need, I don't need six Rolls Royces <laughs> and six wives and six houses. You see, possessions and servants and wives were a sign of God blessing you and wealth. It said when David realised that God was blessing him, he took more wives. He wasn't sinning. It was a sign of affluence that men could have many wives and and. It, you see, we're so besotted with sex on television. We think a man with six women, that's an orgy. It wasn't like that. He called them individually, had a relationship, personal relationship with each one. We're so sordid these days with conditioning that we think, oh, God wouldn't do that. But you need to read your Bible and find how it works. So the king had a relationship, a sexual relationship with each one. Now they were a concubine. And they had privileges. And when they had had a relationship with them, they were put in the harem. And the king could call them at any time to, to spend the night with him. And they were treated right. Okay. He didn't say, well, but he chose Esther. Out of all the women, he chose Esther. Many called, many prepared potentially, but only one chosen. I believe that's the bride. Now the rest who weren't chosen... What did the king say? Back to your village, back to your poverty. No, they were kept in the head. They lived in the palace instead of the, the mud hut in the village. They had the royal apparel. They had the best food, the king's food. They lived like queens, but they didn't reign. They just didn't. A concubine is like a wife in relationship and sexuality, but they don't have the same privileges. If you want to check out, that's the difference between a wife and a concubine. There's no difference except a wife has more privileges than a concubine. So the wife reigns. Esther reigned with the king. She's a type of the bride. The harem are the church. They live with the king forever till they die, don't they? And have the king's food. They live like queens, but they don't reign. Can you see how it's a perfect type? Uh, I've missed a, a scripture when I was talking about uh, 
Revelation and the city and the bride. Just let me emphasize that in eternity, when heaven and earth pass, the holy city of New Jerusalem comes down, doesn't it, out of heaven as a bride prepared for a husband. But there's another category. There's not only the bride, the church in the, in the new heaven and the new earth. Let me read it. It talks about nations and kings on the new earth in Revelation 20, 21. I don't hear people preach on that. It's just plain. I don't know why. Revelation 21, verse 1 to 3. You'll have to go back, Johnny. I'm sorry. I, uh, But I, I think it's necessary to put in. So this is the new heaven and the new earth. So we've... We've had Jesus come. We've had the thousand year millennium. Heaven and earth then pass away. Everything's back to the Father. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Next verse. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. So we accept that's the bride. So if you think that's all who are saved, I'm going to surprise you because we'll read on. And I heard a voice out of heaven say, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So we're not going to dwell in heaven for eternity. I don't know where Christians get that. When we die, we're going to heaven and be with him forever. God's going to come and dwell with us on the new earth. Why does he make a new earth if we're all going to live in heaven? The tabernacle of God is with men, not the tabernacle tabernacle of men is with God and he will dwell with them not he we will dwell with him and they shall be his people and God shall be with them and be their God and Revelation 21 verse 23 26 I, I can't read all in between you'll have to read that for yourself so Revelation 21 verse 23 so it's just said about New Jerusalem, it describes it, the foundations and the walls and the streets laid with gold. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of the Lord did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. That's in the city. All right, next verse. And the nations of them which are saved. So there's nations that are saved. They stand before God in the flesh and blood, and God says, you saved, your name's in the book, you have eternal life. And they have access to the tree of life. And the tree in, in the city, there was a tree with the leaves were for the healing of the nations. What, why do you need to heal nations if we've all got spiritual bodies that can't be sick? In other words, the, this tree keeps you healthy and the tree of life keeps you alive. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. So the city has no need of light. They are light, but that lights the rest of the world. Walk in the light of the city and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour to it. So there'll be kings and nations on the new earth. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. So that's, take, that's, you know, or, or leave it. But this is clean scripture. This is not a prophecy. This is not an allegory, is it? It's telling you what happens. I understand if it's wheels within wheels, we can interpret it 20 different ways. You know, Daniel's weeks and that. Better people than me have tried. I've not even tried to work Daniel's 70 weeks. So, because better theologians have worked it all out. They're right. The trouble is 20 people are all right. and They're different. So it, you know, let's leave all that. But what's clear is telling us about the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and earth. So can you see that the bride is separate? There's those who were chosen to reign with Christ throughout eternity. So the remnants are thread throughout the Bible, isn't it? You know, there are only 12 apostles in the upper room. Not even the 70. God, Jesus had sent 70 out and ordained them, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. 70, two by two like the apostles. They weren't in the upper room. They weren't the foundation, just the 12 apostles. The remnant runs right through the Bible. I told you about Joshua and Caleb. They're the only two that got in. Many called, two and a half million people were called out of Egypt. Only two got in the promised land, Esther. You know, for me, the few prove love. 
You know, I married Jolie because I love her. There's millions of women in the world, aren't there? But I married her, I chose her because I loved her. It wasn't a good idea. It's not a business arrangement, is it, marriage? It should be to do with love. And love is selective. Love's exclusive. Love is narrow and all-embracing. You know, if I love all sports, which sport do I love? If I love all styles of music, which one do I love? I can't say I love any because I love them all. When you love them all, you love none. You see, you've got to take one out and say, I love jazz more than all the other styles of music. I love football more than any other sport. You see, if you love something, it's got to be exclusive. It's got to be narrow. If God loves everyone equally, who does he love? How can he prove his love? It's just nonsense. It, it, you don't understand love if you don't realise it's exclusive. Why did I choose Joni? There's, was it because she was the most beautiful in the world? Well, maybe to me, but not to everyone else. Is it because she's the best cook, the best lover? No. It's just, I don't know, it's chemistry. It's almost like I had no choice. I fell for her. It's, it's nothing to do with me. I, I just fell for her and I chose her. And, and love's like that. And I reject, by choosing Joni, I rejected every other woman on the planet, didn't I? But my whole life is exclusively for Joni, not for other women. They can't get in. If they say, why didn't you marry me? I'll say, I don't know, but tough. <laughs> I don't love you. I love my wife. I can't be seduced because I love my wife. I remember giving a lift to a prostitute once. I was I was driving down the road at the T-junction and a young girl came up and she said, uh, can I have a, I'm going to Mossad, can I have a lift? That was a red light district. And I knew what she was uh, because I've worked with gangsters so I can't, you can spot them a mile off, can't you? So I said, jump in, I'll give you a lift. I'm going past. Abstain from all appearances of evil. So Jesus couldn't have talked to the woman at the well on his own, could he? A, a loose woman. So, and uh, as we was going, she said, you know, she offered the services as, as payment for the, the trip. I said, thanks for your offer, love, but I don't need it. I've got a wife at home, I love her. I, I don't need you. It's all right. I'll give you the lift for free. You see, I, I couldn't be seduced because I love Joni. It, it, it wasn't, and, and I could pick a, that, that woman up. I mean, if it was a week, I shouldn't pick her up, should I? If I had a problem with women, I shouldn't pick her up. But I don't have a problem with women because I love my wife. It's not that I don't admire other women. It's not that I couldn't have a lustful thought. Uh, what man can say is never had a lustful thought. But I can't be tempted because I love my wife. It's exclusive. It's all embracing. You see, it's narrow. And God chose, the king chose Esther. And all the other women weren't in the same. So you need to understand love if you understand the plan of God. God chose little Israel. Why did God chose Israel? He said, I saw you when you was in your mother's blood. Despised and I chose you and I cherished you. And you grew up and I cared for you. And then the time came for when you could make love and I covered you over. And it's quite explicit. It's how I covered you over and you became mine. And he loved Israel. Why didn't he love the Babylon and other nations? Why did he choose Abram? Abram was a, a, an idol worshipper in Babylon, the counterfeit, counterfeit religion. Why did he choose Abram? There's no answer. There's no answer to love. He just, God chooses who he chooses. Will you not allow God a free will? I don't want you to choose my wife. I, I want to have my own free will. Why would God not have a free will? He's got to love everyone equally. Can he not choose? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It's in the Bible. We just don't like that God because we've got equality and rights. and It's all satanic, that. Love is very exclusive, very narrow. Well, Deuteronomy 9, 4 to 6, I've, I've finished now. Let me just read this. This is Israel. They weren't special. God didn't choose them because they were special. He chose them because they were nothing. 
Speak not in your heart after the Lord thy God has cast them out. You're going to destroy all those nations because you're good. No. Next verse. Don't say for my righteousness the Lord has brought me into possession because God, we're good. That's why God chose us. Fancy Christians say, well, God chose me because I was seeking him. It says nobody seeks after God. The heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. Nobody seeks after God. He chooses you. That has brought me into possess the land. But for the wickedness of the nations, it's because God wanted somebody to drive these wicked nations out. That's why he chose you. Next verse. Not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart does you go into possess the land. But for the wickedness of the nations, the Lord does drive them out from before thee that he may perform the word which he swear unto thy fathers, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, the Lord thy God giveth thee this, not this good land to possess for your righteousness, for your rotten, stinking, stiff-necked people. And God chose me not because I was a good man. Rotten, I deserve the lake of fire, and so did you. And anyone watching it, we all deserve the lake of fire. God didn't choose us because, oh, well, God saw my heart. Yeah, he saw your wicked, deceitful heart, and he chose you. Why? No answer. He just chose you. Like I chose my wife, like God chose Israel, like God chose Joshua and Caleb to come through. The remnant always come through because God chooses them. Well, if you don't accept my revelation, many call, few chosen, that's all right. You find your own explanation for it. I believe I've, I've explained what he meant with many called, few chosen. And I believe it's consistent throughout the whole Bible. So I'll leave it there. I better pray for us, Santa Lord. I pray you'll give us understanding of this phrase, many call, few chosen. We don't want to be stumbled, Father. We don't want to be ignorant of your character. We don't. We want to understand love, not as the world understands it, as equality and sentimental, but as you see it, as you understand love. And we want to understand your plan, Lord, that you have free will and you choose who you will. You will have mercy on whom you'll have mercy and who you want to show your wrath, you'll show wrath on. Father, never let's take away your free will. Let's just submit that you are God and we're not. And your ways are not our ways. Help us to understand this, Lord. If there's anything that we can learn from this study, surely it's that we don't understand you as... And we never will, Lord, till we get to eternity. Your ways are in the sea. Help us, Father. I ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. I hope you'll tune in to YouTube, Vimeo, whenever you're watching it for the next study. There's about 70 in the series, so we've got a long way to go. God bless you.